o sea, Gloria González Fuster, I'm chairing uh, this panel, I'm from uh, LSTS in, in Brussels. The only other thing that I want to say, because I'm very, very happy with the composition of this panel, uh, it's a multi-stakeholder conference. We try to bring uh, together many different voices. I think we have a number of voices here in this panel. Some people uh, wanted to come but could not come. In particular, uh, some people from, from private companies, they are very busy, you know this, so they could not make it today. And there is somebody that I want to mention because they, they, we were, they were invited and they did not want to come. And I think it's worthwhile uh, mentioning this. Uh, there is a thing in Europe that we have, it's the uh, AEG, so it's the European Institute for Gender Equality. They are in Vilnius, they are uh, concerned with gender equality, they are paid by, uh, by us, Europeans, to be concerned. And, uh, they said, they, 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 uh, unfortunately, they have an internet policy that they cannot speak at conferences where re re participants have to pay a registration fee. So at CPDP, you don't see it now because everybody's sleeping, but we have an, av an average of 1,000 participants, which means if people don't pay a fee, uh, I have to prepare sandwiches for them the whole <laughs> night, or you bring a Tupperware or your thermos or whatever, so it's very difficult for us to do a conference without a, a registration fee, so I don't know next year when we want to hear what these people at AJ are doing, we will try to find a solution so, so they can come and we know what they are doing too, uh, because they are apparently working on cyberbullying and all this stuff. So that was my point for today, but I will just leave the floor to, to our speakers and on my uh, moderator, which uh, Valerie Steves from the University of Ottawa. She, she will moderate this session and we will very uh, quickly already start. Uh, with the first speaker, and the first speaker is uh, Rebecca Trommel from Leiden University. I I'm not introducing uh, uh, the whole uh, biography, they are online. So please, Rebecca, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking today with two different hats on. Um, my opening um, is going to be more focused on a personal experience that I had last summer with online abuse. Um, but the abuse actually stemmed from uh, research work that um, I will be leading. Um, so let me give you just a bit of the context, set up what the abuse came from. <clears throat> um, last spring, uh, Twitter announced that they were going to be prioritizing work um, or focus on what they were calling uh, healthy conversations on the platform, determining um, what the extent of healthy versus unhealthy conversations were, um, and trying to address any problems that they identified. And then as the company was emphasizing and is, continues to emphasize that outside observers um, were finding on the platform. And so they put out a request for proposals last spring, actually asking for teams of academics to submit proposals for research that would develop metrics um, to actually help them assess um, from you know, different perspectives, different metrics, what the actual health of conversations is on the platform. Um, and much to my great shock and surprise, um, but honor, uh, one of the, or a team that I'm leading is one of the two teams that was selected by Twitter uh, to actually undertake some of this work. Um, and I'm happy at any point to talk more, more specifically about the work that we'll be doing. Um, but for now, I want to tell you what the reaction was publicly to the announcement of this work. Um, in late July, Twitter uh, went public and said we've selected these two teams. Um, and for context, it's probably important to, to know that um, the team that I'm leading is comprised of four women and two men. The second team is comprised of all men. Um, and immediately after the announcement, I mean literally within a matter of a couple hours, the women and the women alone on my team were targeted systematically for abuse. Um, the, the announcement dropped in the middle of a news cycle uh, that was fairly bad for Twitter at the moment. Um, there was uh, a lot of political actors who were accusing Twitter of silencing voices on the platform. Um, and so when our work was announced um, in sort of classic fashion, um, in using tactics that we know fairly well now from Gamergate, um, a couple of fairly well-known um, Twitter users uh, went through the women's feeds and found any tweets that they could spin as problematic or controversial, um, put together a narrative, and in my case, because I was the lead of the project, put on top of this this overall lie, suggesting that I, was now, I had now been hired um, as Twitter's head of its new incivility commission 
To be clear, this is a commission that does not exist. I'm not an employee of Twitter. Um, I'm exclusively all right, leading this outside independent research team. Um, then within a matter of hours of these initial threads going out, um, the uh, coverage jumped to media outlets, larger mass media outlets. Again, fairly standard tactic that we're seeing. Um, and that was when the true abuse really ratcheted up. The death threats, the rape threats, um, oddly uh, a, a fair amount of anti-Semitism in my case, um, in particular because my name is spelled, as you can see up here, um, Rebecca with a K-A-H, which, which is a traditional Hebrew spelling, and so people assumed that I was, an, that I was Jewish, uh, faced a great deal of, of anti-Semitism. Um, and just to give a bit of perspective in terms of how overwhelming this was, um, you know, in a normal, let's say, week, I would get maybe a dozen mentions on Twitter. In a 36-hour period, I had 24,000 mentions. Right? Almost all of these critical and a very large number of them truly abusive um, and harassing. And of course, this wasn't just operating on Twitter, it had jumped beyond Twitter um, and the, the comments that we were seeing on the news reports that were out there, um, the kind of you know, dark recesses of the internet, the threads that were developing um, were really, really, really horrific. Um, I live and work in the Netherlands. Um, you can probably hear uh, from my accent that I actually am from the US originally. Um, but I had in this case effectively an ocean of protection right, between myself and the worst of the, of the abuse. And yet it was serious enough um, that security officials from the university and from my local town got involved. Um, and I had you know, police driving past my house uh, for a while to make sure that, that I was safe. Um, it has taken me now truly six months to feel comfortable to talk about this. Um, it was, core, of course, immediately profoundly um, you know, impactful on my life. I was suffering panic attacks for several weeks afterwards. Um, but even beyond that, right, the kind of um, emotional impact, I pride myself on being a supremely rational right, person. Um, and yet this hit me on such a deep level that truly for months afterwards, um, I really struggled to come to terms with this. And it's really only in the last truly several weeks that I've started to feel more comfortable being able to talk about this publicly. Um, one of the things that, that I want to sort of stress um, in all of this is that I was, right, though this was so horrible for me personally, I was, in essence, one of the lucky ones <clears throat> in this situation. Um, I you know, uh, have lots of resources at my disposal to deal with this. I research exactly these type of phenomenon, and so I knew what was going on, even though right, I couldn't fully intellectualize it. Um, I had uh, you know, connections that I could go to in the larger um, data privacy and protection community and reached out to within a few hours to help me make sure that my online um, presence and my data were as secure as possible. Um, I knew how to handle this in a way that the average woman facing this sort of abuse doesn't, and even I was completely overwhelmed. If I hadn't had these people to help me, I don't know what I would have done. Um, beyond that, right, myself and the other women on my team, we were partners with Twitter, and so we got kind of insider access to help us deal with, with what we were seeing at least on Twitter, right, not beyond, but certainly within Twitter. And yet, right, it, near, it wasn't nearly enough for us to deal with this situation. Um, one other quick thing that I want to stress uh, in talking about this is, though it's taken me some time um, to realize this, to recognize this, one of the things that um, I, I think is, is important to stress is that I now really recognize that this wasn't about me, right? It wasn't about Rebecca Trombel. It had nothing to do with me personally, although the abuse, the harassment was very personalized, right? It absolutely came at me at a personal level, but it wasn't ultimately about me. Um, it, was a, it was about what I represent um, as a woman, 
as an outspoken woman. Um, I'm a political scientist. I'm a political communication scholar. I believe in the power of political expression. And that was reflected, right, in the tweets um, that, were, that were turned against me and other members of my team. Um, but it also speaks to the way that these tactics are used both for profit, um, true you know, monetary profit, and for political gain. Um, the narrative um, that you have these right, elite academics um, who come from the outside and have a particular political perspective, and so clearly they've been brought in to silence others, um, helps drive outrage. Outrage brings profit. Outrage brings political mobilization. And in a way, I can actually understand and perhaps right, potentially even forgive those individuals right, who are essentially buying into that larger outrage narrative um, and become part of the, the larger campaign of abuse and harassment. What I can't forgive right, are those who I truly believe know full well um, what they're generating, what they're coordinating in the conspiracy theories that they're driving, in the, um, in the you know, purposeful effort to generate outrage in order to, in many cases, truly line their own pockets um, while simultaneously you know, mobilizing particular political groups. Thank you very much. There will be time for questions at the end. I think it's better that we have all the present, short presentations and then, but pl please do, if you have questions, keep them in, in mind or reactions or what you want to say. We just move to, to the other speaker. Uh, it's uh, Milena um, Marin from Amnesty International. She has been working for already some time on, on this intersection between technology and human rights and now especially focusing on this question of platforms and, and the protection of, of women. So please, uh, Milena. Thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you for sharing your experience, it's truly powerful. Um, at Amnesty, we see online abuse as a human rights issue, so obviously we look at it from this, this lens. Um, and what we've seen from talking to women for a long time that face online abuse is that abuse is silencing. So it causes women to limit what they, they say, so indeed women that are outspoken are targeted the most and they tend to you know, limit their conversation, sometimes leave platforms altogether or even censor what they post. So for us is a, is a human rights issue um, and we looked at it in this lens. In, in a way, we also responded to their healthy conversation call. Um, we've been doing research on, on Twitter for a long time, but we wanted to look at the true scale of abuse online. So we have a lot of anecdotal experiences from lots of women around the world that have been spoken about online abuse. But what we wanted to, to see is like, what is the true scale of abuse? So to look at that, we engaged in a large uh, project called Troll Patrol. We called on our uh, digital volunteers around the world. We're lucky to be an international organization and have access to uh, lots of volunteers that want to contribute to human rights research. Um, and what we did, we monitored the uh, accounts of about 800 women politicians and journalists from UK and US. So we looked at all national level politicians in UK and US, and we looked at the selection of journalists from certain media organizations. So we looked at all women journalists from those organizations. Um, so over a year, these 800 women received about 14 million tweets in mentions and replies. And out of those, we selected uh, 228,000. And we analyzed these tweets. We asked uh, our volunteers through a crowdsourcing project to read these tweets one by one and classify them whether these tweets are abusive or problematic. I'm going to tell you the difference between abusive and problematic and the type of abuse they could see. So we had about 6,500 people participating. Each tweet was analyzed several times so that we had redundancy and could, we could see agreement between uh, various people in the crowd. Um, and we looked at all that data systematically for a whole year. Uh, we worked with a tech company to, to do the data science. They are a very rigorous uh, organization called Element AI. Um, and what we found from that is that um, on an average, uh, women receive about 7% of their mentions are either problematic or abusive. Um, so abusive, you can understand what it means, is tweets that are against Twitter's policy. They, they would break their, their rules of engagement. They would be tweets, you know, 
uh, very violent tweets, uh, rape threats, death, death threats. Um, they would um, be targeted at the, at the person's identity, be it gender, sexuality, ethnicity, religion, and so on. Um, but we also introduced this concept of problematic, which is maybe doesn't qualify, it doesn't uh, have this intensity as an abusive tweet, uh, but we still think can have a silencing effect. So this would be, this would be hurtful tweets that, and, and you know, harmful content that if repeated could have that, that silencing effect. And we wanted to see a, you know, a diversity of, of abuse. We didn't want us to stick only to, to, to the definition and we're not arguing that these tweets have to be censored, but we looked at women and what their experience is. Um, so yeah, what, what we found is that about 7% or one in 14 tweets that women receive, or at least the women in our study received, were either problematic or abusive. Uh, we found uh, really worryingly, and this is something we knew, but we didn't have the data to back it up, that women of color was, were most affected, being 34% more likely to receive abusive content. And in particular, black women were really the most targeted, 84% more targeted than white women. Women. We also looked at the political spectrum. We looked at you know, women working for right-wing organizations uh, or left-wing organizations, and we saw that you know, it's kind of an even distribution. Abuse doesn't discriminate by left or right. Um, so it, it, was, it, it was incredible just to put the numbers on, on it. it we, we got a lot of media attention. I think one of the most interesting unintended consequences was that um, Having the numbers to back up the experiences that women have been talking about for such a long time um, had even an effect on Twitter's bottom line. Uh, there were um, financial investment companies that picked up our research, um, and as a result, people stopped <laughs> investing in Twitter for a while to the extent that their shares dropped 13%. Um, so th this kind of research, I think, hopefully, hopefully puts, puts more of an emphasis on, on, on the problem, especially from a women's perspective. What we did in addition to, to all these was use all the data that we generated through this um, uh, labeling exercise with digital volunteers to train an algorithm uh, to see what kind of role automation can play in content moderation. You know, it's so hyped, everybody talks about it. We wanted to see for ourselves what it means. We were lucky to be able to partner with a really um, cutting edge technology organization that has access to uh, very high end algorithms. Um, and what we've seen is like, even with a very large training data set, with a very diverse training data set, um, our algorithm was extremely imprecise. It uh, had a 50% precision. So while experts identified one in 14 tweets as abusive, the algorithm would identify two in 14 tweets as abusive. Uh, so that means that it overestimated the abuse. That means that it classified as abusive tweets that are very likely legitimate speech. Uh, it means that it didn't understand the nuance in speech. Um, so yeah, our conclusion was that we're definitely not there yet and um, it, it will take a long time before automation can be a true solution to this problem. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Thank you very much. So you raised many important issues, notably this question of how do we measure the extent of, of the, the issue. And I think another issue is uh, how do we frame this issue from a human rights perspective. So it's a freedom of expression problem. It's a, it's a, it has many dimensions, discrimination, many dimensions. And for, of course, this is a privacy data protection conference. And one of the big questions is how does this all relate to privacy? This is why we are very happy to have with us Eva Bloom uh, Dumontet from Privacy International. She has been working on this idea. How can we now think today about privacy also from a woman's perspective? Please have the floor. Thank you. Um, so over the past year, Privacy International, uh, we've been working on this question of the intersection of, uh, of gender rights and the right to privacy. And um, essentially, you know, we, we, we try to cover the sort of like very wide range of, uh, of issues. We, we look at uh, the social, cultural, legal implication of privacy uh, and what it meant for women and we and gender diverse people, and you know we, we dived into uh, into feminist critical theory to see what was said about privacy. Uh, but obviously, for the purpose of the few minutes I have uh, today, I, w I will focus on uh, on online gender based violence. 
And actually, it should be fair, the question of underlying gender-based violence was sort of the, the starting point of this research. Uh, because I was originally contacted by uh, a woman from um, La Fondation des Femmes, the Woman Foundation, which is a feminist organization in France. Uh, and essentially, she was working with, uh, with a group of um, public figures, uh, feminist activists, sort of uh, quite high-profile feminist activists, who uh, had to close down their, their Twitter accounts because they had been uh, they had been targeted by uh, mass uh, amounts, like large campaign of uh, trolls uh, online who were harassing them, and. What they, what they saw as the the issue is the the question of um, of anonymity and the fact that uh, those trolls who were harassing them were essentially anonymous accounts and uh, their perceived solution to the problem was that um, you know we needed to to end anonymity on social media and so she um, she contacted me and she told me that she's struggling to work with privacy groups and digital rights group because. Uh, she felt that we were getting in the way of uh, women being able to express themselves safely online. And so th this was kind of my, the starting point of my question, was that is the right to privacy actually actually failing women? And to be fair, looking at the discourse in the UK and, and across Europe, uh, actually, you know, th that kind of narrative was uh, seemed to be to be quite dominant. Uh, in the UK, we have uh, we have a few female MP members of Parliament uh, who have been uh, targeted also by campaigns of, uh, of of trolls who are harassing them online. And uh, and the response, the immediate response, their demand uh, has been: Can we end anonymity online to to try and end this problem this way? And uh, I saw uh, in Germany they, they seem to, to have been so, sort of similar debates. Um, so that, that was kind of, uh, that, that was, as I said, my, my, my distorting point for, for some of my research. But then I sort of uh, took a step back and from, you know, the, the debate that was happening in Europe. And I conducted quite a lot of interviews with organization uh, across the world in, uh, in Asia, in Latin America, in um, in North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, to kind of try and see uh, their perspective. So I was engaging both with a uh, digital rights group, but also a uh, feminist organization. Uh, I'm really pleased to see Nigad Dad in the room because obviously Digital Rights Foundation was uh, one of a big partner on this uh, on this project. And I was, I was keen to hear uh, what their the perspective was on, on the issue. And, Sort of one of the things that started emerging for me, which I, I found quite interesting, was actually a new way of thinking about this problem uh, as actually a, a question of privacy and, and sort of noticing how at the core of online gender-based violence, uh, there was a violation of privacy. And so if we look at the way online gender-based violence manifests itself, uh, when we think about e you know, issues like non-consensual image searing or doxing, you know, we have very obvious uh, violations of privacy. Uh, with harassment, I guess it, it's not necessarily as obvious, but actually, you know, hearing Rebecca's stories as well, and this idea that, like, very quickly, it's like, you know, we, we know where you live. That, that kind of that kind of discourse, uh, you realize that also in a in a lot of, in many forms of harassment, there is this idea that, you know. If we go back to the origin of what the right to privacy was, the right to privacy was the right to be left alone. And essentially, harassment is about creating a space, be it online or in real life, where you're not left alone anymore. You have 24,000 notifications. You, you can't be left alone anymore. And obviously, one of the questions was discussed was, uh, was anonymity. And I was quite keen on hearing the perspective of other organization on this debate around, you know, is anonymity essentially the real problem? And, um, and actually, the, the discourse there were, was very different because for a lot of organizations, for example, that were also working on LGBT rights in, uh, in countries where, um, uh, well, uh, homosexuality is criminalized, uh, the immediate response was, no, I, anonymity is, you know, uh, is a life savior for us. Uh, I was talking with a trans activists who talked about how before transitioning, actually being able to have... Um, 
to have expressed their, their, uh, their real identity online before they even transition in real life, uh, what had been absolutely you know, necessary for them. And, um, and their fear that uh, real name policies on social media was getting in the way of being able to explore, uh, to explore their identity. Um, but actually, you know, even without going, uh, you know, to countries where uh, where forms of expression are necessarily criminalised, even you know, even in the UK where I live, uh, for example, civil servants are not uh, supposed to be expressing uh, their opinions publicly. Uh, so, being able to to have anonymous accounts is the only way to express themselves. A lot of people working in the private sectors actually would face uh, similar restrictions. So, again, anonymity is the condition for them to be able to express themselves. Uh, but also, interestingly, uh, I realized from speaking with some groups that uh, for a lot of victims of both online gender-based violence, but also uh, domestic violence, uh, anonymity was um, a way to protect themselves, a way to, uh, to escape the, uh, the abuse they, uh, they were facing. Um, so quite a lot of groups were quite um, adamant that you know, anonymity was actually something that needed to be protected. And... I should stress that I do not want to dismiss the, the concern of, uh, of women who have been targeted by anonymous trolling. And this is obviously, uh, this is obviously an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, I, we're not here to solve this issue today, but I, uh, th those concerns are absolutely real and, and, and shouldn't be dismissed. I just, um, I, I, I just don't think any anonymity is, uh, is the right solution and the right way of going about uh, solving this problem. Um, the, the other aspect that I, I would like to mention as well um, is, um, is the question of um, uh, what some uh, scholars have called like performative trolling that actually, um, you know, for, for some uh, for some harassers, they actually want their name on it. Uh, a lot of the harassment that takes place online is not necessarily anonymous because people are proud. Or, or there is this uh, daring aspect of look, I uh, I'm going to go and harass this uh, this feminist under my own name, and I'm not afraid because uh, somehow the mere uh, the mere fact of doing it online uh, provide the, the protection that that they find uh, sufficient. Now, when I was uh, when I was mentioning uh, harassment and how it was a form of uh, privacy violation in a maybe less obvious way, I think one of the big themes that emerged from uh, from our research was how sometimes narrow definition of uh, of privacy wasn't really serving uh, uh, women, and by that I mean that originally the, the right to privacy was very much. Uh, connected to the home, and you know the, the right to keep the state outside of your uh, of your home, and obviously for reason of uh, domestic violence, you know th this wasn't really a helpful definition for women. Uh, also, um, you know wh when the right to privacy is tied to home ownership, when women still today. Uh, are not necessarily allowed to, to own their own homes, to own where they live. This is not necessarily a very helpful uh, definition of privacy. Uh, but actually, what, what we've seen is that you know, gender issues have uh, transformed our understanding of privacy. So, for example, uh, the legalization of abortion in the U.S. was the case. Uh, Roe versus Wade was using um, abortion as uh, was using sorry uh, privacy. As, uh, as the reason why abortion should be legalized. So suddenly abortion, beca uh, sorry, privacy becomes tied to, uh, to bodily autonomy and to issues beyond, uh, beyond just you know, the privacy of communication or the privacy of your homes. And so I will just end on this because I think what's interesting is that we live in an era of like smart cities, uh, internet of things where, you know, the, the dichotomy between offline and online is, uh, is completely changing. Our understanding of, of privacy uh, will have to change and will have to evolve. And this is just to end on research that Privacy International has been, uh, has been partnering with uh, UCL, uh, University College London, on how you know uh, Internet of Things uh, devices could be used in cases of, of gender-based violence, and I think you know we need new definitions of, of privacy, and I'm I'm hoping that uh, actually gender issues will help us uh, shape this debate.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So you mentioned you're not solving this problem, but uh, probably somebody should solve the problem. So this is why we really need policymakers uh, in our panels and our discussions. And we're very, very happy that this year actually we got somebody from the European Commission uh, brave enough to come here, even if there's no official uh, thing policy as such tackling this specific issue as such. But uh, very happy that somebody uh, from DigiJust, from the European Commission, Ingrid Belander Todino, um, accepted to, the invitation to come here and, and engage in the discussion. So, uh, looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I work in the Gender Equality Unit on Violence Against Women. And um, we look at violence against women as a range of, of types of violence, including cyber violence. Uh, as you know, that the U online abuse can take many forms, and uh, many of those forms are illegal under national law. And it's quite interesting when you see that people who can um, do whatever they want online, they wouldn't do it in the physical world. So we, we have really a problem here where, where do you draw the line, and how do you go after people who, as you say, abuse people online, they can do whatever they want, they can commit easily a crime without even th maybe thinking about it or n not caring about it. You don't need to face your target, you don't need to see the consequences of your actions. And even if the victim supports the, the offense, it's very difficult to, for the police to investigate and, and get a prosecution. So in most cases it's total immunity, impunity and the behavior just continues and the online content keeps on uh, popping up for the victim and the suffering continues. So it's something that we have to really look at. Um, we know in recent surveys on violence against women in Europe, one in three of women have been um, victim of some form of violence through, through their adult life and one in 10 women have experienced some form of cyber violence since the age of 15. And we also know that young women are more at risk of cyber stalking and harassment than older women. Um, so some experts say that we shouldn't make the distinction between online and offline violence. Online violence is a continuum of offline violence, so to speak. A uh, domestic violence victim has often also been abused online by the partner. And that is especially not uh, ending when the relationship ends. So, um, as with any form of violence, um, cyber violence can manifest as sexual violence, psychological violence, economic violence. The victims have consequences in their job because of some content that's online about them. Physical violence, they're being, they have physical consequences also uh, performing acts online that they are forced to do or even committing suicide. We have many cases of that uh, hearing in the news recently. So I think that it's important to remember that many of these forms of online abuse are illegal in the uh, national law. Uh, so even if member states of the U European Union has not specifically uh, legislated about this, it is uh, in many cases illegal under the general criminal codes. So criminal investigations and prosecutions shouldn't need to be uh, uh, waiting for specific legislation. So that is uh, something that uh, in theory is the case. We all know that it's difficult to investigate these crimes. So um, I think that is, although the argument would be, some say that it's a continuum, it's, it's this, it wouldn't be a distinction between online and offline violence. Uh, I personally think that we need to look at this specifically. There are many forms of violence that are uh, specific for online, and we need to address this phenomenon better through policy and law. Um, and most countries are struggling, and they're just starting to recognize the differences of, of as I mentioned, the differences between these types of violence. And uh, they're starting to to address them in domestic law, and the EU is no exception to that. Uh, so what are we doing at the EU level on combating uh, online abuse, harassment, and other forms of violence? 
as you probably know, there is no specific legal instrument right now on addressing online violence and abuse against women at the European level. But we have EU law on a range of cyber abuse, cyber violence, including um, sexual abuse and exploitation of children, the directive, which is criminalizing uh, online abuse and child porn. We have the directive on human trafficking, which is also criminalizing these uh, offenses. We have the cybercrime directive on attacks against information systems. There are also measures on identity theft and misuse of personal data. We have the framework decision on racism and xenophobia, which criminalizes uh, hate speech. And we have the Victims' Rights Directive that um, provides uh, minimum standards on support and protection of victims of crime. Uh, but the most uh, specific legal base for acting on violence against women now is the Istanbul Convention, the Council of Europe Istanbul Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women. It's not EU law yet. We are in the process of uh, acceding to this convention in the EU. Uh, but 20 member states of the EU have already ratified this convention and it's legally binding and it provides criminal criminalizing of violence against women. So although cyber forms of violence are not explicitly mentioned in the com convention, it's clear and understood that these are forms of psychological violence, stalking, and sexual harassment that are explicitly included as uh, crimes in this convention. So we really work at the commission in my team on trying to get as many as member states to uh, ratify this convention. We still have eight, Bulgaria, the Czech Re Republic, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, Ireland and the UK have not yet ratified this convention. Uh, but we have 20 countries that have, and uh, that is already a good start to start really to work in this area. We also shouldn't forget the Council of Europe's Budapest Convention on Cybercrime that also sets out rules on crime committed uh, via computer networks. Um, so there is some legislation in place. I, it's... It's not specifically on online abuse against women, but we have a legal framework. But is that the most effective? I've been asked now to only talk about the regulatory uh, framework, but I also think it's worth mentioning the work that the Commission does with internet platforms uh, on hate speech, racist and xenophobic hate speech, with a good practice, the code of conduct that you might have heard of. It has proven um, effective on removal of content. Right now in the last monitoring, there were 70% of flagged content removed um, after um, a flagging system involving civil society across Europe. That is the best practice that we could look at uh, now in the future to see if we could replicate that on online abuse also for women. The legal framework is different, I know that, but I think it's worth that something uh, in that line could at least start happening. But of course, we, I can't say what the next commission will do, but it's something that we are already start looking at now. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, yes, Valerie, your turn. Hi, is this on? Great. Um, do you know, whenever, whenever I participate in these conversations or conduct this kind of research, it always strikes me that viola violence against women and girls is such an old issue. Uh, and technology is a really win interesting window into that, that issue. Um, Ursula Franklin um, is a Canadian uh, physicist who was active in the anti-nuclear movement in the 50s. And as a woman and an academic, you know, going through school in the 30s, um, experienced an incredible amount of, of, of uh, discrimination and, and uh, harassment. And um, uh, whenever she would talk about these issues, she would always go back to the telephone. 
that when the telephone, which I just take as such a for granted technology, uh, first came out, the big debate was whether women should be allowed to use it. Because if they could communicate with men outside the home, they, they would commit adultery and they needed to be controlled. And so technology is a really interesting window because it gives us an opportunity to look at how um, gender is, is disciplined within our, our social organization and our legal organizations. Um, so Rebecca, I want to start by thanking you because I think it's absolutely essential that we focus on the lived experience of these forms of harassment. I think if we fail to do that, then our conversations can be really ungrounded. Uh, and um, so, so I, I was hoping you would start by talking a bit about this interface between violence against women and technology. You know, what is it about platform responses that that were helpful? How does a platform bear any responsibility in this issue? Well, you know, I think that that one of the the trickiest issues when dealing with um, online harassment and abuse actually goes back to something that you said, you know, essentially in, at the very beginning, right, of your presentation that these tactics are being used to silence, right? And they have the silencing effect. And so I don't think platforms have done a good job yet of wrestling with the contradiction. Um, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and so many of these other social media platforms are prioritizing, are forwarding, front-ending, essentially, free speech, right, as one of their top priorities. And they don't want to be censors, and they don't want to silence people on the platforms. But the, right, the other side of that double-edged sword, the other edge, um, is that those exact same principles can be turned against voices on the platform to have the exact type of censoring silencing effect um, that, you know, they, that the platforms themselves say they don't want to be responsible um, for, you know, taking, taking charge of. Um, and in this case, you know, I don't think that there's any sort of easy solution. We're not going to solve the problems here today. But I think that um, one of the first steps is, is for advocates um, to push for a more robust dialogue about um, the two sides, right, of this kind of free speech coin. Um, and for the technology companies themselves to take some responsibility and acknowledge that uh, free speech um, exercised in certain ways, right, the, the kind of limitless idea of free speech exercised in certain ways um, has the exact opposite uh, implications that, that they're emphasizing. Whose speech? <laughs> yeah, speech? So free speech for me and my buds, but uh, uh, maybe not for everyone. Um, so so they're, they're, these technologies then, what I'm taking from what you're saying, are, are also um, designed with certain assumptions in mind. And, and I, I don't think that that's an intentional thing, but it is something that plays out over and over again, especially when you look at the intersections of technologies and power, whether it's racism or, or uh, misogyny homophobia. So, Milena, is there something about machine learning that, that exacerbates these kinds of issues? Well, absolutely. So, just first of all, from my experience, what Twitter is telling us is that they are not 100% rolling out the machine learning promise and they are not using it to police content uh, as, as of now or not any type of content. They are using it for spam content and I think some of the most extreme um, hate speech. Um, but they are using more advanced algorithm, algor algorithms to monitor behavior of, uh, of abusers um, and take down accounts on the basis of that because uh, in, in that philosophy of them valuing freedom of speech, they do not want to look at all at content. Um, our, our experiments with machine learning and we think that it's going to be used more and more. We know that Twitter has various partnerships with different organizations. We've seen recently they partner with UC Berkeley 
on machine learning to develop algorithm for healthy conversations. So they will, this, this will happen more and more from now on. So I think it's really important for us to understand what machine learning means in this context. So that's why it was extremely valuable for us to go through this experiment ourselves as a human rights organization, a civil society, to see what are the compromises you have to make when you build an algorithm. Um, so lesson number one is that when you build an algorithm, especially in language processing, um, you have to deal with margin of errors and the margin of error in large language processing can be very high and you have to make trade-offs and compromises um, so accuracy in machine learning has two measures um, it's it's quite technical one is called precision one is called recall but basically you have to make a trade-off between one or the other uh, on if you if you opt for more precision uh, in online violence against women it would mean that you identify the content that is most abusive so you identify truly abusive content, but you might miss out some content that has you know, nuanced abuse. And we've seen that um, perpetrators online use a lot of these tactics you know, to mask their speech so that they pass uh, moderators, they pass uh, algorithms and so on. Um, another another trade-off that you can make is, okay, so you don't want to go for this uh, high precision, um, but you could cast like a wider net so you catch um, a lot of potentially abusive content, but uh, with the trade-off that the content that you catch may be um, legitimate speech, so maybe false positives, um, maybe words that could be abusive but are used in a non-abusive way. Um, so language is really subtle, is really human, is very imprecise, and um, I think we're at the point where algorithms are not very helpful. So we, we really have to understand this and understand the dangers and understand that technology by itself is not a solution. You know, the, the Silicon Valley mindset is that technology can solve any problem. Um, and I think that's such a fallacy and we have to understand that this is such a complex issue that requires complex, com complex actors uh, and, and a variety of actors. So I appreciate this panel is so interdisciplinary because that's what we need. We need wide societal conversations um, and we don't need just technology. Thanks for that. Um, Ingrid, I have a question for you actually and I'm not sure if it's a fair one. <laughs> Oh good, lucky you. Um, one of the things we hear when we talk to kids about these issues, so I do a lot of qualitative work, um, especially around gender, and, uh, is that they say actually these technologies make it easier for them, not harder, in the sense that when somebody does something outrageous, they can get a screen capture of it. And they can take it to a school principal, they can take it to their parents if they want to, and they can say, this is what's going on. So there, there, there's sort of this, this, this trope out there that these technologies make it hard for people because they can never get away from it. Uh, and yet what we hear from young people who, who are very active in, on these kinds of sites is that there can be um, benefits to having technologies that make these problems kind of slap you across the face obvious. Uh, that it's an interesting window into the way that gender and power play out in, in ongoing social relationships. So um, you were saying countries are struggling with, with how to respond to this. Um, is it possible that this is, is, is actually an important moment of political mobilization precisely because it's hard for us to ignore when it becomes so viscerally visible in public debate? Yeah, I think that for, for kids already uh, at national level, they have come quite far. They, it's easier, to, so to speak, to regulate abuse against children, not only sexual abuse. There are now countries like Italy where they have a cyberbullying law proposed. I don't know if it's adopted already. So that we can all see, and that's part of the whole youth policy as well. You protect children from abuse. Of course, online uh, activity also has an empowering effect. The gender movement, we want to reach the younger women as well, and they, they can voice their, their um, activism and so on, on online. So of course there's always a, a line to draw, but um, for, for adult women, the line that we need to draw, the hate speech versus free speech, is of course illegal content. And that is of course legally where we might struggle, because a racist hate speech is more clear-cut possibly than misogynist hate speech. 
uh, I certainly think from a woman's point of view that it's psychological violence, you, you need to prove that. But it might be more difficult for the lawmaker and the law enforcement to uh, implement. But from your original question on how do we use technology um, to protect and to empower young women and, and older women too, um, I think that the uh, system where you have a civil society based flaggers possibly could be a good solution. I don't know what the panelists think about that. If machines can't do it, can we get activists and, and uh, supported civil society organizations to help out? Not to censor the internet, but to flag cases where you have clear, clear doubts about the content. Well, it, it's, um, it, I did an analysis of, of um, community um, regulations on, on social media. On, on, it was on sites that kids tend to hang out on. And what really fascinated me was that um, uh, on every site except for Wiki, it was done by the corporation. But Wikipedia has a, a mechanism where it, it um, relies on people within the community to help resolve conflict. And, and it's a very human focused um, 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 response. And it, which leads me to a question I have for you, Eva. Um, I'd love to hear what you think is uh, um, um, the way we should be mobilizing privacy to deal with these. And it really struck me that when you were talking, especially when it comes to, to gendered issues, so much of, of this is an exercise of power to keep women out of public spaces. Rebecca, it goes to, back to what you were saying at the very, very beginning, that this is a disciplining exercise. You know, get out of public space. You don't have the right to have a voice. Um, is there a way that we could conceptualize privacy that that helps us navigate that that movement from private to public spaces and 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 acknowledge that this is actually exactly a nexus where equality issues play out because power is exercised there. Yeah, and actually, uh, to, to go back to, to to the earlier point we were discussing about, you know, that not being a completely new issue. Actually, uh, Mary Bird, who's a, a, a British academic who has herself been the subject of a lot of abuse, was. Um, talking I've, uh, very uh, intelligently about the way um, the way historically every time there was woman in the public speech, uh, woman in the public discourse, there was always there was an, uh, always an attempt at silencing them, and and in a sense th this is just a new episode in a long history of, of silencing women who are expressing themselves publicly, and I think. You know, your question points to one of the, um, an interesting problem, which is the, the nature of social media, because it's not quite a public space in the sense that, it, and this is what we're discussing actually, it is very much a, a space that's run by private companies. Um, and yet it is a space that's public, that's pretty much ac publicly accessible to all. And you know, it, it, it raises questions around, you know, what we call social media intelligence as well. Like, what does it mean, for example, for the police to be to be navigating those websites when you have uh, public access to all the content that a person is going to post? Where does talking start? Where does it like legitimate access to the content? Uh, that people are posting online is, you know, and so, so those are those are quite tricky issues because we never had to deal with this kind of space before. That's neither completely public, neither neither private, and th this is why when I call, you know, for new definitions of privacy, it's also to try and address uh, those issues. Is because I do think. You know, as we all said, we're not going to solve today the, the question uh, the question of online harassment. But I think part of the part of the question is allowing women to to define their space and to to decide what they what they want to see. Um, you know, in their feeds, in their uh, in their mentions. I think one interesting uh, analogy that was made for me was uh, was the question of spams and and you know wh when email started uh, we used to be completely uh, you know co receiving we, we used to receive all the spams right and and the issues of spam has essentially disappeared uh, well actually largely thanks to technology because the, the technology got better at um, at filtering spams and, and we, we don't see them and it's not because they don't exist anymore it's just because or 
uh, email clients have become better at, at sorting this out. And that's not to say that like there is a technology that we suddenly are going to develop that's going to uh, filter out the abuse because I, I do agree that I think the, the issue is much more complicated. And at the root of the issue, there is uh, there is a misogyny of, of, of abusers. Uh, but I think part of the solution will be about um, this question of space, of, uh, of allow allowing uh, a private space on those, uh, on those publicly accessible spaces, if that makes sense. Well, we'd love to open it up to um, questions and comments from the audience. Microphone's right back there. Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Aurore Dupuis um, from Excelium Services. Um, I have, I thank you all for these wonderful comments and contributions. Um, I have one uh, element I would like to add to the conversation uh, that hasn't been talked about, uh, especially when it comes to filtering and flagging. Uh, we see these flagging farms in India, for example, where people read this abusive con content. Um, have you, you know, I, I just wonder what's your opinion or, or comments on these kinds of uh, psychologically draining activities of flagging. Thank you. I can speak about that a little bit from my personal experience um, and what we actually learned, uh, again, being partners with Twitter um, as we were going through this. So, um, I think that it's fairly well known now, and Twitter has actually been talking about this more publicly, that they see it, they recognize it as an issue. Um, but of course, um, taking down content requires actual reporting. Um, and the, uh, the onus is primarily on the person who is being abused, right, or being harassed in the moment. Um, Twitter treats firsthand reports um, by a different standard than bystander accounts. Um, and I think part of the principle behind that is actually because of the concern about exactly these sorts of um, larger scale flagging efforts that just as I was talking about a minute ago with free speech, right, as much as those can be used for good, they can also be right, um, part of actual targeted campaigns of harassment themselves. Um, however, using the principle that it needs to be, you know, the person who's being abused um, or harassed in that moment who is actually flagging the content um, means that, you know, in theory, you have to be watching it, right, while you're undergoing it. Um, and from a psychological and emotional perspective, right, we simply cannot be asking people to deal with it. I, abs I watched for far too long, right? I tried to keep my, my researcher's hat on and watch this from a distanced intellectual perspective for hours on end, um, and it did so much more damage to me. Um, we had the privilege, our, had the t our team had the the privilege of working with Twitter and being able to say, here are the people that we're designating as our surrogates, and they treated those surrogates as first-hand reporters in our case. And as soon as they did that, then the content came down much more quickly. But that was a privileged position that we had in our relationship. So I sort of agree with the, the concern, um, the more broad concern about the, the ways that these flagging systems could be used um, for as much harm as for good. But I think there's probably some sort of midpoint between that and the um, requirement that it's actually the account that's being abused that does the reporting that could be much more helpful in this, particularly partnering with civil society organizations like Amnesty and others who are looking directly at this and could have teams right, that are essentially certified, that are known and trusted. One other very quick thing that I would add to that, though, um, is simply that that is hard, hard work. Right? And we know from um, all of the external content moderators that Facebook has hired all over the world that the um, emotional, psychological uh, burden of doing that sort of work is absolutely intense. And so if we were to promote those types of systems, um, from my perspective, it would be absolutely essential that before those were implemented, there was lots of research and testing and development in order to understand how you can, you know, 
aid the people who are doing that work from the beginning to, to be able to psychologically withstand it. I mean, there are stories of people being truly hospitalized after doing this work. Hi there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Aviva from Tilburg University, and thank you for this brilliant panel and, and tackling all the connected issues as well, like you know the interplay between privacy and freedom of expression. I have a question about um, uh, a recent initiative by the Dutch police who have been trialing. Um, they're going around uh, to classrooms of primary schools, the, like the last two classes, advising girls not to share um, not just their pictures or nude pictures or semi-nude pictures, but also um, sexual texting. And I, I thought this was highly worrying, and then I asked my students about it, and they were like, well, um, they sort of didn't know how to react, because they're like, okay, if the reality is, because the reason for the police to do this, they said is, well, of course you should have this right, but we simply can't protect you, and we're understaffed, and we don't know how to deal with this. And then my students were like, um, you know, completely torn between uh, allowing the police to give realistic advice, um, we cannot protect you, so yes, we should advise you how you can protect yourself, and the other half of the students who were like, well, this is, you know, outrageous. And I was, I was wondering if any of you um, have made a connection to the police, because indeed a lot of this is simply illegal, um, have you have you looked into that? Um, so first of all, I would um, strongly recommend everyone uh, take a look at the work of a Brazilian organization called Coding Rights has done called Safe for Nudes. Uh, I think this is properly outrageous. It's also just very. Uh, it fails to understand how teenagers work, <laughs> uh, how sexuality works. Uh, you know, it, as any form of prohibition just when it comes to uh, sexuality and dealing with teenagers just doesn't uh, doesn't work. Uh, the, the fact is that I mean they are they are safer ways of uh, of sexting or of sending news. Uh, there are conversations to be had with teenagers about you know hiding your face, about you know sending uh, sending secure messaging. And yeah, we have to be honest about like the limitation of that, the, li the risk. Uh, but also any any form of prohibition just I think really goes in the wrong direction. Yeah, well, I think from a gender equality point of view, this is clearly stereotyping why the girls would be targeted and not the boys, because I think there are equal uh, issues there, and also not only posting but accepting the photos should also be an issue where where they should. I think it's not a bad idea to inform. And that should take into account the, the kids' needs and, and habits. But definitely, I agree with you that prohibiting like this. And also the fact that they would then understand from the start there's no point on doing anything because the police won't protect them. That's really the wrong message. And that is also very problematic from my personal point of view. I've been granted the right just to add something. I'm not supposed to, to speak, but uh, so it's not a po problem of the, of the Dutch police. It's a problem that is general. Uh, when you look at all the, the uh, even the European level uh, campaigns on raising awareness of what they call privacy, this is the question: What do we call privacy? It's all about uh, stay at home, no? Be safe by staying at home. Don't do anything that you're protected. And so there's a need a need, I think, to rethink privacy and data protection. Also, we have been uh, working with the European Commission on, on, on explaining this idea that everybody has a right to data protection. It includes the right to, to share pictures and have those pictures protected uh, as any other picture. But there, there, is, there are different ways of framing this and just this idea that indeed uh, everybody has rights and it includes the, the girls' rights. It's a difficult one, not only in the Netherlands, but at many, many, many levels. And even when you talk with parents, they all fall into this digital hygiene thing that it's a terrible idea for me. I just, sorry. I'm going to throw in my two cents too. Um, Jessica Ringrose did some fascinating work on sexting in London. And uh, uh, the, the, the headless sext came up very soon 
after sexting became more common in among young people because it's obviously a, it's a way of protecting your privacy. And, and the boys that were collecting the sex or that were receiving the sex from girls um, felt that this, this took away from their street cred because they couldn't prove that it just wasn't a picture they grabbed off the internet. So they would have girls take red lipstick and write the boy's name on their chest and then take the picture and send it to, to, to the boy. And, and just to put this in context, actually most sex are, are sent by boys to boys and you know in a, in a joking kind of way but but I think it's really important to look at the um, sexual economy that the online world has created and that there's a commercial milieu and and commodification that has really amplified these kinds of, of sexist tropes um, so it, it seems to me that part of the solution has to be um, looking behind the business um, strategies of a Twitter and not saying, oh yeah, take down content. Yes, take down content. But, but I think we really not, need to start to think critically about um, how those assumptions play out in ways that create unequal outcomes. Please. Thank you. Ivan Seke, Central European University. I think um, the most important question uh, for a target, for a victim, how to respond to the clearly abusive uh, message to the troll. One solution could be that you close down your Twitter account, but th that's not a solution. Uh, you, can, uh, you can prohibit online anonymity, not a solution. But what is your opinion about a more radical or provocative solution to respond to the trolls in their own language, in their own style, I know that it's, uh, it's controversial because we, I mean we, we don't use such a language and uh, maybe it could lead to the escalation of, 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 uh, of the whole war, so to say, but this is the language what they understand. Secondly, if you manage to make them feel ashamed or humiliated, maybe it's impossible, could have an effect if they feel that they are bounced back in a certain way and not, they attack, not only attacking you, and then we organize discussions about that, and they continue doing what, what they do anyway. What's your opinion on that? Who wants to take whether we should feed the trolls? Well, I, I think if you, if, if we take Rebecca's uh, example, like it's probably humanly impossible to respond to 25,000, 26,000 mentions. So I, I don't think the onus should be on the women to fight these people. So uh, again, I think both what you are talking about, the police, you know, and what, what you're suggesting is putting back the responsibility on women to solve the issue, on the victims to solve the issue. And I don't think that's fair because they are already facing uh, such, uh, such violent attacks. And I think it's really important to understand that it's not single individuals very often. These are coordinated, concentrated efforts. There's very often bots behind these efforts. It's automated. Um, so the, the, the solution cannot be on women to respond and to engage in conversations. Um, we often recommend to, to report because unless, unless women report, it's, it's hard to do it. We, uh, we sometimes hear from women that they, they delegate that responsibility to friends and family uh, because simply reading all this is too much. Uh, so just going through your feed can be highly trauma traumatic and engaging in conversations can further that trauma. So uh, what, you know, certain women decide to mute conversations, so just not see them, but that can also be dangerous because you miss um, threats that could be, could be real. Uh, threats that you might need to call the police because somebody leaked your home address or somebody is telling you that they are waiting for you in, you know, in front of your home at 7 p.m. with a gang of people to rape you. So it's, um, you, know, you, you should be aware what's, what's happening on your feet, but not <laughs> um, sometimes women themselves can't deal with that, so they delegate, they delegate to other women. I think some of the most creative solutions that I've seen uh, was women sharing lists of trolls. So they, uh, uh, you, you can block entire lists. Um, so women are sharing with each other uh, and are adding to known list of trolls. So I, th I think these are some interesting creative solutions, but I think engaging. Um, I've, seen, I've seen sometimes women doing that and converting um, people. Um, 
but you can't do it. I mean, it can't be a woman's responsibility, in my, my opinion. Well, we're at our five-minute um, um, bell, so we'll take the, the last question or two, just quickly. May I clarify? No, I, I think we're, no. we're just to give okay. a chance to, to get the last okay. two questions. Okay, we can I'm continue sorry. that conversation afterwards, though. I think that would be wonderful. Well, um, Elise Lassieux from the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, uh, your, your presentation. I think that we have different point of views. Um, I heard what uh, the um, women were saying before uh, regarding the intervention of the police in the class. And what really, really uh, struck me was the fact that uh, it was an advice directed at women not to do something and not at potential abusers. And so that made me think, would you have any uh, um, good practices regarding education uh, at school, high school, university, on uh, abuse and on the fact that online harassment, offline harassment, they have a, a tremendous uh, psychological effect. And so to teach on people and what they do uh, um, under anonymity can have uh, yeah, terrible impact on persons. So about education, thank you. Okay, we have three minutes left, so it's going to have to be a very quick question. Um, hello, my name is Eliska, and I'm a trainee at the Fundamental Rights Agency. Uh, actually, Elise is my supervisor. Um, and uh, I was wondering about the issue, like I heard a lot, lots of terms such as hate speech, that then potentially lead to uh, bullying women online, really. But for me, hate speech is such a vague and contextual term, and there is a very valid argument with silencing women and kind of chasing them away from the whole conversation. But then when it also comes to uh, online violence against women, for me, that kind of steps out of the realm of freedom of expression debate, really, because that may potentially, and often does result to a certain incitement of violence or form of discriminations that impact their everyday existence in online and offline space. So I was actually wondering whether there are any initiatives and cooperation with the law enforcement agents in terms of training, uh, uh, sort of like uh, really getting out the message that this is just not some kind of online meaningless conversation, uh, but organized online mob that really actually attacks, for instance, female journalists on a regular basis. Thank you. So we have four speakers, 15 seconds each. So in one sentence, what would the final takeaway message or response be from each of you? We'll start at that end and work this way. Um, I agree. Uh, training the police is an absolute uh, mandatory first step we need to take. The police is not taking this issue sufficiently seriously. Uh, that's oh, one of the key things we need to address. Next in line. Yeah, for me, it's, it's just acknowledging how much of a complex issue it is and how it requires conversation between different actors. I still think the companies themselves, because they are profit-making companies, have a huge responsibility, but it is a broader societal issue and we all have, uh, have contributions to make. My main call would be for, I, I agree that um, the technology companies themselves bear the primary responsibility for dealing with these things, but the technology companies need to do a much better job of bringing in a diversity of perspectives and prioritizing because what they're doing is fundamentally social work, bringing in the experts who can speak to the underlying social and normative issues that are at stake here. Yeah, I would say that there, we need to attack this from different angles. Even if we don't have specific laws, we have a framework of regulation at the EU level that we need to implement and apply. And we have, to answer the question, we have already regulation on uh, police needs to be trained, we have professional uh, training required under the Victims' Rights Directive and so on. So, of course, this is something that is in place already, but we need to implement it and do better policy and law. Thanks. Well, I'd like you to join me in thanking the bellman has come, and we will now say thank you to our panelists. Thank you.